Shabbat Shalom. One of the benefits of reading the same Torah readings each year, year after year, is that each Parsha becomes a benchmark, a benchmark rather, against which you can measure change. That feels especially poignant approaching this week's Parsha, which describes the famous mysterious disease known as Tzara'at. When we read it last year, we were just getting used to COVID-19, aware of the obvious connections between the ancient text and modern life. Parashat Tazriya Metzora combines two Torah portions, each including material that's relevant for pandemic life. Tazriya describes ritual impurities, focusing on the impurity of disease, while Metzora focuses on the priestly ritual for re-entry after a person's infection. I spoke last year about how we wished we were ready for Parashat Metzora, the second of these two parshas, looking to our text for a ritual signifying that the disease is gone. At the time, we were not yet prepared for re-entry, stuck as we were in Tazria, the first Parsha, a morass of infection and fear. But tonight, we're a year closer to an end of the pandemic. And increasingly, we might be more ready for Parshat Mitzora, still languishing under the pressure of COVID-19, but more serious about a ritual of re-entry. Parashat Mitzorah begins, Zot tihye Torat ha This shall be the teaching, the ritual for the afflicted one. The Yom Tehorato, at the time he is to be cleansed. The Svat Emet, a Hasidic sage, teaches that the word Torah appears here, Torat ha to demonstrate that just as the individual was sent away, was socially distanced according to the Torah's rules, so too must they re-enter the camp through Torah. And indeed, the Torah offers plenty of insights on the subject. Once the mysterious disease passes through a person's system, after they have quarantined for at least seven days, a priest shall go to the individual to assess their health. And if they're ready, he shall take two birds, sacrifice one of them, and then dip the other one, the living bird, into a blend of blood, hyssop, and cedar, after which he will sprinkle the individual seven times with the mixture. Now, if anyone thought that getting the disease was bad, perhaps they should have some perspective. And after all that, the Torah says, the individual must shave their head, wash all their clothes, and wait another week before re-entering their home. Finally, and this is more or less the end of the story, although there's actually much more. Finally, they present a sacrifice from which the priest will take blood to place on the individual's ear, thumb, and big toe to concretize the status of purity. Now, broadly speaking, I don't think this exact process is going to work for us moving out of the pandemic, unless you're looking to do a kind of performance art piece and you have easy access to livestock. But surely there is something to be learned here. At the most basic level, it's useful to note that the Torah devotes more verses to describing the ritual of re-entry than to describing the disease itself or to the quarantine it required, which is a reminder that our process of return may take longer than the process of addressing COVID in the first place. And it will be different for every individual. Though the mitzora is socially distanced to protect the public. Ultimately, each mitzora, each individual, must go through an individual journey back to normal life. So what might we take from this Parsha into our own individual rituals of re-entry? We may not quite be ready, but it's time to think about what the process could be once we are ready, hopefully sooner than we might think. For starters, it seems a makeover is in order. The Mitsura would wash his clothes, shave his head, and bathe in water. And the commentaries point out that these acts were practical hygienic measures, sure, but they also had psycho-spiritual significance. We too might find some way of revisiting our physical bodies as we creep out of our homes. Maybe that's a new haircut or a new wardrobe. 
Maybe it's simply grooming ourselves in ways that suit us better than while we were stuck inside all day. But the point of departure seems to be doing something with our bodies that makes us feel like we're ready for a change. And then if we are to take these rituals seriously, we might consider giving an offering. Before the individual can get the requisite blood dabbed on their body, a person needed to bring three lambs, some flour and oil to the priest to serve as different types of sacrifices. What might we offer? Perhaps it's a donation of money. Perhaps it's a commitment to volunteer or be generous with our time in some way to advance the various causes we learned were especially important to us during the pandemic. Public health, racial justice, creative Jewish life, or any other cause we found to be newly important to us this year. The Torah goes on to say that this offering shall be given according to the means of the individual. They can bring fewer lambs or a cheaper alternative and bring less flour, but everyone must give as a recommitment to the collective. Giving of ourselves to bring about a stronger tie to the community and perhaps stronger institutions that serve us as a group. And with this in mind, we can take steps to ensure that global health crises like COVID do not continue to emerge. We can take stock of the systems in which we live to understand the inter in interconnectedness of all life and give room to consider the impact on our planet beyond merely human beings of this deeply human crisis. The medieval French sage known as Hiskuni reminds us that when the priest dips a living bird in the blood of another bird that has been sacrificed, the living bird then flies free. According to Hiskuni, this bird then returns to the flock covered in red and can never return to normal avian life marked in this way. Even for the bird who makes it out alive, she is still marked, which makes me wonder about the ecological cost of the pandemic the wrappings and takeout containers, the disposable masks and chemicals that protected us during this time. It makes me wonder about the impact on the rest of the planet. In the hierarchy of our needs, it was essential to figure out how to eat and live safely. But so too is it essential to revisit how the ways in which we survive and thrive as human beings might have a negative impact on the planet. To this end, we might make sustainability more of a focus in what we go on to create in post-COVID life. In each of these ways, we can find examples within our Torah portion for how to mark a transition, perhaps our transition back to normal life. Whether by changing our appearance or giving something of ourselves or even finding ways to reduce our individual impact on the planet, the Torah gives us a model for what to do how to ritualize our transition away from a state of spiritual distress. A ritual, as I said at the beginning of services, is a conscious expression of the self. And since our selfhood has been so radically altered over the past year, rituals are all the more necessary for us to reassert our relationships to ourselves and to the world around us. Being able to say Birkat HaGomel after receiving the vaccine, as we'll do in just a moment, is one useful ritual. And as we transition slowly, we will likely need to find many, many more kinds of rituals to help us move forward. Fortunately, the, the Torah is chock full of ritual inspiration, especially if we're able to move beyond the minutia of animal sacrifice. It should give us hope that as we read Tazriya Mitzora this year, we are able to think seriously about the latter portion instead of just the first and how we might learn from it. It does not mean that we are finished with this crisis, but it does mean that we have moved forward since the last time we read this Parsha. And as we got through the last year together through Torah, may the Torah get us through to next year an even better year as well. Shabbat Shalom.